Hello everyone, and welcome back to the second part of the mobility guide. In this section, I'm going to be focusing on why mobility is so important, and I'm going to start explaining exactly when and how you should be moving across the map. To start, I want to talk about what justifies over two hours of videos on this topic alone. As I've said several times before, I consider mobility to be the difference between an okay squad leader and a good one. To explain why this is, let's take a look at the beginning of a hypothetical match. Let's assume here that every SL is at least decent. They've all passed the awareness aspect of this guide, and they all understand where they need to be. Let's also assume that one infantry squad on each team is dedicated to backcaps and counter-rushing. The other three squads on each team commit themselves to rushing the midpoint. At face value, you might expect this to turn into a reasonably fair fight. As it stands now, we're looking at a 27v27 on the midpoint and it's reasonable to assume that it will all come down to how well each team fights over the midpoint. That's not usually true, however. In reality, it's going to come down to how well each team performs in the mobility department. Let's assume that on Op 4, a Logi truck is driving too aggressively and flips shortly after leaving main. Immediately, Op 4 is down 9 men. The other Logi truck stops at fortification to place an FOB. They intend for this to be an attack fob for Crucible, but they don't have a firm grasp on the ideal distance and location of attack fobs, and they aren't all that familiar with the fob placing meta on Mestia. The third squad makes it to the northwest part of the hill, places a rally, and dismounts. On Blue 4, let's assume that two trucks manage to make it to a common fob location near Crucible Gamma. The third one is too aggressive and runs into an SBG techie north of the objective and is destroyed. Blue 4 is now down 9 men as well. If you look at the map now, you'll see that Blue 4 now outnumbers Op 4 2 to 1 on the objective. Not only that, but they have a significantly better FOB placement. Don't forget that I'm including spawn points under the mobility section of this guide. Not only does Blue 4 have an inherent advantage in the initial engagement, but when both wiped squads spawn at their team's respective FOBs, Blue 4 will be reinforced quicker than Op 4. Blue 4 also has much better options for aggressive rally placement, as they already have an FOB close to the objective. Op 4 is going to have to be careful with rally placement, as a wiped rally will mean walking from the FOB again. The point that I'm trying to make here is that good driving and map knowledge allowed for these three squads to arrive at the objectives in the best possible shape that they could have and a solid understanding of the FOB placement meta allowed this squad to place a much better FOB than the enemy squad. Even though the 27 people on each side decided to go to the midpoint, it really ended up being an 18v9 in the initial engagement, allowing Blue 4 an immediate advantage. Even if it eventually does reach 27 versus 27, Blue 4 will still be in much better shape due to their significantly better FOB placement. That's assuming that it actually reaches 27v27, as in this situation, Op4 needs to strongly consider getting a squad on Warehouse before Crucible is full capped, and Blue4 needs to be strongly considering attempting to beat them there once they feel that Crucible is sustainable. This is why I often say that squad matches aren't truly 40v40, or soon to be 50v50, they are 5v5, or 6v6. The squad leaders will almost always decide the outcome of the match. It's quite uncommon to see equal numbers of players fighting over objectives. Generally speaking, one team will have more experienced SLs that get their men to the fight and keep them there, and that will give them a numeric advantage on most flags for a majority of the match. But, for the sake of argument, let's also look at a match where that is the case. Both teams have SLs who are not only aware, but competent when it comes to mobility and overall equally matched. When every single person on the map is fighting on one of the two active objectives, squad is as balanced as you'll ever see it. It can honestly even be self-balancing in a strange sort of way. What I mean by this is, let's imagine a situation where shortly after a match start, both teams have an FOB on both relevant objectives. All FOBs are constructed at around the same distance away from the objective, and they're all in equally good places. Even if your team is way too heavy on the attack, when your team desperately needs more defenders, that will tend to work itself out. You will lose your objective, but the overwhelming manpower on the attack objective will generally secure a double neutral for your team as that's happening. The fact that you're losing your defense objective would suggest that there are more enemies attacking it than defenders holding it. 
by this same sort of law of symmetry, that means that you have more bodies on the attack than the enemy does. If the defenders largely outnumber the attackers on one flag, then it stands to reason that the same is true on the other flag, where the rest of the team is. Both teams will be losing roughly the same amount of tickets on offense, and you won't be in too terrible of a situation. As I said, there's a symmetry between two competent teams on two unchanging objectives, and the individual skill among players is usually balanced enough that it's not quite enough to push either flag over the edge before the other one falls. This is one of the reasons why double neutrals are so common in this game. If I had never played squad before and somebody described the details of a double neutral to me, I would assume that it was a fairly rare occurrence. That's far from the case though. If a flag is being captured, chances are that the attackers outnumber the defenders. If that's the case, and both teams are equally matched and equally competent in getting their people to the flags, then the same is often true for the other flag. This is heightened by the fact that when a spawn goes down, most squad players will immediately spawn at the next FOB they find that's close to an active objective, rather than trying to make a new approach on the objective that they used to be on. If you successfully disable an FOB while attacking an objective, there's a good chance that a majority of the defenders who are fighting you will now spawn on the attack, on the next FOB they find close to a relevant objective. If we assume that your defenders were already outnumbered, there's a good chance that the new spawners will only increase the rate in which your defenders get pushed back, which will often lead to a double neutral, as you are already neutralizing their flag and now they are standing a much better chance at neutralizing yours. This is why it's imperative that you remain on active objectives for as long as possible, with as little time in transit as possible. It's why I constantly stress that you shouldn't be walking between objectives. Even if you are supporting the wrong objective, the symmetrical nature of the game might save you. But if you're in the middle of nowhere for far too long, taking 9 men out of the action, it's going to cost you. As I said before, most squad games are won or lost because a certain number of people are not near objectives. The games where both teams are constantly active on them, where it's a proper 40v40, those games are rare and very close and tense. Even in these rare scenarios where mobility isn't playing a big role in the game, a flag capture will eventually happen. The first time a flag falls is what I call the turning point of the game. In a very short amount of time, the two relevant objectives are going to shift. Some portion of both teams will be left stranded somewhere that doesn't matter, and the team that has the ability and the awareness to react the quickest will manage to get nearly 100% of their team back onto relevant objectives first, giving them an inherent advantage on the next set of objectives. Squad is advertised as a slow-paced game, but at the command level, that's far from true. The firefights are more drawn out, sure, but your team's ability to swap objectives at breakneck speed will be the deciding factor in most matches. If the more mobile team was the one who managed to capture the flag that set this change in motion, it will oftentimes set off a chain reaction. The more mobile team will reach the enemy's new defense flag before the enemy has time to react, or sometimes even realize that there has been a shift in the battlefield. They'll easily capture that flag, recreating the exact same scenario while the more sluggish team fails to keep up. Until the slow team wisens up, this process will repeat itself over and over until the game is won by the team favoring mobility. You'll often hear veteran squad players mentioning momentum. This is what they're talking about. I don't necessarily love using that word because it's not strictly accurate in the actual definition of it, but it will give you a good feel for what's happening. On the flip side, if the more mobile team was the one that lost the flag, they'll be fast to react to defending the new defense point and will prevent the enemy team from exploiting their temporary weakness. This will give the more mobile team a second chance at taking the game back. So if mobility is everything, then how can you take advantage of that? First off, make sure you're remembering what I said in the previous two guides about awareness. Always be watching the map, judging the sustainability of cap zones, and guessing where the match is going to be heading. Once you start feeling as if you're making heavy progress on the attack flag or losing your defense flag, you need to start preparing yourself mentally to relocate. Make sure your squad is also aware of this. I find it's best to warn everyone that we're very likely going to need to leave in a big hurry well in advance. If you're sitting on the defense flag and you have a nice spaced out net of infantry, start drawing them back in preparation if you see that the attack is going well on the next objective. 
Obviously, you don't want to leave yourself entirely defenseless until you absolutely know you can leave, but you're going to want to make sure that they don't have far to run in order to get back to the truck. It's usually at this point that I start driving the truck into a position where everyone can get to quickly, all while keeping a very close eye on the map to know exactly when to call the shot to leave, and also to make sure I'm not getting too close to any danger if my squad is engaged. If you're defending a flag and your team has started capturing the attack objective, you are usually clear to move up the moment they neutralize it. This is assuming that you're certain that the attacking force has neutralized your enemy's spawn points. You must also be sure that they won't leave cap range. As long as you leave after they've neutralized, the enemy team will be unable to neutralize your flag before theirs is captured, even if they start capping the moment you leave. Obviously, you don't want to leave if your flag is in the process of being neutralized itself. You're trying to avoid a double neutral here. Now, pulling off this early has a few drawbacks. If you're disengaging from a firefight to do this, you're leaving enemies and an enemy spawn point on a flag that could potentially come back into play. You're also likely going to lose whatever spawn you had there as they spread out over that objective. You also might be allowing them to take the cap down a bit, even if they don't stand a chance at neutralizing. That could potentially speed along their process if they start capturing the objective later on in the match. All of that being said, I will still do this in almost 100% of situations. I'd like to iterate again that everything I'm telling you to do in this guide has exceptions. I'm well aware of the potential downsides to the strategies I suggest. The reason that I stand by them is because I'm not determining the correct course of action through conjecture or speculation. I'm speaking from over 1500 hours of observation and experience. I have personally utilized the strategy hundreds of times, and I have seen others utilize the strategy hundreds of times as well. In squad, the likelihood that you are going to be greeted with a ripe, undefended attack objective is significantly higher than the chance that you're going to get caught up in a hard fight, the defense objective is going to fall out from under you, and then you're going to need to return to the place that you left, which is now in a worse state. I'm not saying that this hasn't happened, I'm just saying that the reward outweighs the risk by a massive margin. The first scenario is much more common than the second scenario. And of course, don't forget that this does depend on your ability to assess the attack objective. It's entirely possible that you'll make a mistake while assessing it and declaring it to be sustainable and deciding to leave prematurely, when in reality it was under attack and you just weren't observant enough to notice and then your flag falls out from under you while you're in transit. One thing that you should note about situations like this is that even if your friendlies were being absolutely terrible and they walked off the objective and they left it totally exposed before it was even capped and the enemies came in from a different angle and it was an absolute massacre, it's not going to be healthy for you to think of this as, oh, that is my team's fault and I'm not going to take any responsibility for my actions. It's much more healthy to think, oh, I drastically overestimated my team and consequently made a bad call, which is now leading to me not being on the defense objective when it needs me most. You have to be a realist about these sort of things. As I've said, in this situation, you should probably be going to the new attack objective. The other squads already have full control of what is now your defense flag and the enemy is in a vulnerable state because of the shift of objectives. Depending on your haste and the experience of your enemies, there's a very good chance that you can walk straight into the new flag completely uncontested. I tend to use the term leapfrogging to describe this motion, where the ex-defenders become the new attackers, while the ex-attackers become the new defenders. This is a very good strategy for keeping that game-winning momentum going. What if you're one of the attackers in this scenario? You've just neutralized a flag, cleaned up their spawn point, and there seems to be no more enemy contact. Your actions should be dependent on your ability to mobilize and the intentions of the rest of your team. Let's say in this situation you've completed your attack with another squad. If you have a truck handy, allowing you to mobilize quickly and make it to the next objective, and you can get verbal confirmation that the other squad will stay and defend, I would recommend moving up to the next objective. You are closer to it than the defenders, which means you're even more likely to reach it while it's undefended. Let's also not forget that the defenders might not even go for it right away. I've already explained what you should be doing if you're the defending team in this situation, but not everybody knows how valuable that is. 
Not everyone's going to recognize the extreme importance of speed and aggression in squad, and in most games, it will be up to you to keep that game-winning momentum going. Now, the obvious downside to this is that right now, because of the flag switch, team-wide, you only have two squads on an active objective, and now one of them is leaving, even before the other two squads are able to get anywhere useful. Now a lot of newer, more cautious SLs will look at this and say, we should wait and secure our defense objective before thinking about offense, which would technically be true and would be some wisdom if it weren't for the fact that the offensive objective will never be more vulnerable again. Now, of course, it is theoretically possible that right as you leave the attack objective, the enemy team manages to make their counterattack, and they successfully wipe the people that you left there defending and begin neutralizing the flag. This might not be an issue if you can get to the undefended attack objective quick enough to secure a double neutral, and you'll still keep the game in the exact same place, but... That's not always the case. It is possible that the enemy team reacted quickly and got people onto the defense objective early and you're going to be met with a fight there, a fight that you can't overcome in a quick enough time to secure a double neutral. It's also possible that you'll simply be spending enough time in transit that they are able to re-fully neutralize and you've reached the point of no return where even if you begin neutralizing the enemy's flag, you're not going to get it in time. All of that being said, in the majority of situations, I will still do this. Once again, this comes down to my experience from observing hundreds and hundreds of matches. The times that I've captured another flag by extending even further in situations like this are much greater than the number of times where I've lost the newly acquired flag because of my actions. Now, the margin isn't as extreme here as it was in the last one I was explaining. There is definitely a bigger risk to taking this strategy, but you still have a pretty comfortable margin here, and I would still recommend doing it in a vast majority of situations. Now, to continue even further on this topic, there have been some pretty extreme examples where I have been the only squad on the offense objective, managed to capture it, and have still decided to continue pushing. Sometimes I've split my squad into two in order to continue the attack, and other times I've just left our newly acquired flag completely undefended in order to secure a lucky flag capture or double neutral on the next one. The situations where this is practical are much rarer, and I've only ever had it occur to me in desperate games in which two quick flag captures were the only possible way of winning, or situations in which I felt that a double neutral even deeper into enemy territory could be the incentive that my team would need to actually move up to relevant objectives. Or sometimes, in times where I have had a very firm grasp on the skill level of the enemy team, and assumed that they would not only be late to securing their new defense objective, but wouldn't even make it to their new attack objective in time to neutralize a completely uncontested flag before I had theirs. Now this is an extreme measure, and I wouldn't recommend it, but it can be food for thought while you're thinking about this entire process. Now, of course, I cannot talk about all of this aggression without warning you about the dangers of overextending. There's a common and frustrating, incredibly frustrating misconception that some people start having when they're on an objective beyond the attack objective. They know that they are in a great position if the attack objective is taken, so they will sit and wait for that to happen rather than moving to assist. The trouble is that they consist of 25% of the team's manpower. It is possible that our team will take that objective and will be better off by having people ready on the next objective, but it is more likely that we won't make any progress due to being completely outnumbered on the objectives themselves. Even if we're still making progress on the attack objective, it's reasonable to assume that we outnumber them there because we're outnumbered on the defense objective. Remember what I said about the symmetry earlier. It's just as likely to be a double neutral than a successful capture, which will still leave that 25% of the team beyond the attack objective in a useless position. Half of the time, you'll see these overextended squads blame the rest of the team for being unable to capture the flag and forcing them to fall back. They won't consider that a huge reason that is, is because they are not assisting. Instead, they'll just keep patting themselves on the back for managing to find themselves in such an advantageous position and then blaming the rest of the team for letting them down. Now, usually these squads are the result of a failed rush at game start. 
maybe they managed to keep the enemy from capturing the objective for some time, but once the flag was lost, they refused to relocate. Or maybe they just arrived too late but carried on anyway because they made contact with enemies and didn't understand how and why to disengage from irrelevant firefights. Sometimes, however, it'll just be squads with good intentions trying to do the very things that I just encouraged and push and push and push and be aggressive, but without correctly analyzing the map and judging the flow of the battle. There's a very fine line between aggression and overextension. This is the reason why I'm really hammering home the points regarding flag sustainability and completely removing spawn points. If you are trying to get on the enemy's objective before it becomes capturable, then you need to make damn sure of the three things that I've already mentioned. The attack objective must have all enemy spawns wiped and be sustainable. The defense objective must be unable to be neutralized before you fully captured the new objective. That means that the attack objective has to be fully neutralized, and your defense objective cannot have been started to be neutralized before that point. And you must keep a close eye on how your friendlies are doing on that attack objective. The moment they start running into trouble and you're no longer certain that you'll full cap that flag, you need to either fall back on it and double down to the attack or return to the defense objective that you've left in preparation for the enemy to take their flag back, if they're already making progress. If you find yourself in a situation where you've overextended, don't forget that you can always drop a cheeky rally on the inactive enemy objective. If you find yourself in needing a rally after you leave, you still have the option to drop one and wipe your forward one. If you don't, however, then now you have a quick way to start spawn shifting and taking a likely undefended attack objective if the game starts shifting in your favor again. In all of the scenarios that we've talked about, your team has been the one capturing flags. What if the turning point was you losing your defense flag? If you were an attacker, the situation is simple. Leave. The effectiveness in which you leave could very well determine the outcome of the entire match, so hurry. Honestly, you probably should have left much sooner. You should have known by analyzing the sustainability of the defense flag that it was going to fall, and from the moment you started seeing cap go down or you saw that the people were dying and there was no hope for recapture, you needed to ask yourself a question. Will I begin neutralizing this attack objective before our defense flag is neutralized? The moment your defense flag is neutral, unless you've already started capping, there is no chance at a double neutral. I call this the point of no return. If you don't believe that you can pull that off, start relocating now. If there's a possibility, urge your squad on and explain how dire the situation is. Make sure you're preparing them mentally for relocation in the event of failure so that they are aware that they are likely going to be needing to get into a truck very soon. If your squad is proving to be too troublesome, do not hold up. They will still mindlessly wander into the meat grinder in front of them, deaf to your pleas and unaware of the urgency of the situation. Tell them to hold their spawns when they die and wait on a rally at a relevant objective. If you can get 5 or 6 people in your truck and to your new defense objective 60 seconds quicker than you can get 8 or 9 people there, I would take it. Spawn shifting is one of the most effective ways to move your squad from objective to objective. I'm not talking about shifting spawns to an already constructed fob, I think that goes without saying that of course it's quicker to die and respawn on the next objective than to drive there, but I'm talking about gathering a certain number of people into your truck, beginning to drive them to where you need to be, and then instructing everybody else to die as quickly as possible and then hold their spawns. Once you're able to get a spawn point at the new objective, you will have several people waiting to immediately spawn there, and then you will be able to push on as intended without taking as much time as you would have to load everybody into the truck. Now of course, this is assuming that there is a firefight at the place you're leaving, and of course it's one of the most effective ways to leave there as it's much easier to let people get tunnel visioned and turtle up and continue their irrelevant engagement while you are busy actively getting to new objectives than to take the time to explain to everyone that they need to stop what they're doing and move back. 
this once again comes into the point I made where getting five or six people into a truck and leaving quickly is better than getting everyone into a truck and leaving later. Now, of course, spawn shifting won't work if there's no active firefight going on, but you shouldn't generally need to spawn shift if that's the case. As long as you're letting everyone know in advance that they need to get into a truck fairly soon, and as long as you're keeping everyone fairly close, you're not going to have any issues getting your entire squad back into that transport truck, because none of them are going to be taking fire and feeling incentive not to listen to you. Now one other thing I'd recommend doing in situations where you're spawn shifting is trying to keep an eye out on the players who are still in the firefight. If you see somebody go down and then respawn in the same exact area and continue that irrelevant firefight, I would strongly recommend kicking them. Not only are they not listening to you and not contributing towards the objective, but this is honestly a kind of a personal issue for me. People really need to learn that they need to respect the SL's decisions and follow his orders. If you're trying to lead a squad, there is only so much you can do if everything that you said is only heeded 50% by your squad. These kinds of people who are willing to completely disregard what you have to say in order to continue to do what they consider to be fun need to start getting kicked from squads and need to start learning that squad isn't the kind of game for them. Now that you have disengaged from the attack objective, you have a very important and very difficult decision to make. Should you go to your current defense objective that's being captured, or should you leap over to the next flag in line? Now this is all about timing and the skill level of your opponents. Most people overestimate their ability to stop an enemy from capping. It's going to be a fight, and it's going to take some time. If the enemy manages to fully cap your flag during said fight, your new defense objective is going to be exposed and in danger. Very few squad leaders have the foresight to skip a flag and cut the enemy advance off, rather than attacking the defense, as I like to call it. Now if you are very fast to react to the beginning of the loss of your defense objective and you're fairly close to the defense objective, and you see a route that you can come in where maybe you could likely take down the attacker spawn point and really, really properly secure that defense quickly, then you can try to go for it. But in a vast majority of situations, I would recommend just leaping over to what will become your new defense objective. Think back to all the advice I gave when you were talking about your team being the one capturing an objective, and how you needed to keep that game-winning momentum rolling constantly, and now assume that the enemy team is doing the same thing. In a lot of situations, you can just assume that once your defense flag is fully captured and completely becomes the enemy's, you will immediately start seeing your next flag in line begin to be captured as well. Anytime you're facing a good team and nobody on your team has the foresight to cut them off, you'll start to see this happening. Now, I have seen a genuinely depressing number of games in which the mindless blueberry horde on my team has chased each lost objective. Every time they get close to recapturing it, the enemy team has captured our completely undefended defense objective, rendering the old attack objective completely irrelevant. Ever dutiful, the mindless blueberry horde slowly drags their feet to the new shiny hypnotizing attack marker just because it's the closest thing to them, and the process repeats itself as you bang your head on your desk. You must relocate to cut the enemy off, not chase after them or you will always be one step behind and too late to make a difference. Now, as I said at the beginning, there are some situations where you can fall back and double down on that objective that you're losing if you are fast enough and if you know you can be effective enough. Like I said, this is one of the harder decisions that you're going to have to make in these exact situations. Should you go and be cautious and prevent them from rolling, or should you be a little bit aggressive and minimize the damage that you are going to sustain from losing that flag? Now, I've been squad leading for a long while now, and most of the decisions I make are fairly robotic by nature. For example, if our friendly team has neutralized the attack objective, and there are no more contacts there, then I will leapfrog over to the next objective. Usually it's fairly simple and I follow the same basic set of guidelines. However, in this exact situation, it is really quite subjective. You have to be judging the skill level of the enemy team, and you have to be giving your best guess as to how quickly and how effectively you can actually change the tide if you decide to go to your defense objective. 
To start, I would err towards the side of caution more and generally leap over to what will be your new defense flag. But you can start to get a little bit more aggressive as you go, and hopefully it won't bite you in the ass too much. Now, if you were a defender when the enemy captured your flag, your options are a bit broader. If you were completely wiped off of the objective, generally the best course of action is still probably going to be heading straight for your new exposed defense objective. If you were simply pushed off but still have active spawns, chances are that you should continue to assault the point and try to reclaim it. At this point in time, it's very important that you communicate with the rest of your team and try to instill a sense of urgency regarding the new undefended point. If you feel at all sketchy about their response and don't think it's going to be covered in a timely manner, just go do it yourself. It sucks to pull off of an active objective when you're probably one of the only squads on one, but this is another example of idealism versus realism. Ideally, another squad that isn't on an active objective will react with urgency and quickly cover your exposed flag, allowing you to stay at the objective you're already fighting for and are already close to. Realistically, it's entirely possible that they won't be able or willing to get to it in time, and you are the one with the awareness and insight to understand the importance of that. Despite your squad being in the best possible position to assault out of everyone else, the defense is now more important and nobody else is handling it as well as you could. Earlier in this guide, I said I would talk more about when you should start thinking about mobilizing when playing Invasion. Regardless of whether you're attacking or defending, I've found that it's best to start moving yourself and two of your squad members to the next flag in line the moment you start noticing the sustainability of the defense failing. If you're attacking and you're starting to make progress, start getting an attack hab ready, hopefully in time to beat the defense they'll rush to the next flag. Given that invasion only has one active objective at any given time, leaving it with only two people, which is required to create a fob, shouldn't be that big of a concern. A majority of each team's 40 to 50 players should hopefully be on that active objective already. Invasion is a lot simpler than advanced and secure, and as you push up you don't have to worry so much about leaving a defense objective open because there is no defense objective. Now, there are of course some downsides to this. If you build a new attack hab for the next objective and then your current attack fails, it's possible that people who preemptively spawned on the new attack fob will be stuck out of position. This is also worsened if your attack fob on the current objective fails. Instead of being patient and smart and waiting for a new spawn point to be constructed by their SLs, there's always the possibility that a mindless horde of blueberries will start spawning at your new fob and forming a lemming train to walk back to the first objective. Like every other aspect of my guide, the reason I'm recommending this despite the potential negative effects is because I've seen it work more often than I've seen it fail. You're probably getting really sick of me saying this, but once again, for the fourth time, I just want to make sure that everyone's aware that I know the downsides to my recommendations, and I am still standing by them because I have looked at both possible options. Having a FOB prepared for your next objective will streamline your team's advance, potentially enough to take the flag with no resistance. Instead of waiting on the mediocre SLs to recognize that they need to move up, then waiting for them to herd all their cats and witnessing their slow advance, have a spawn ready so that their dead can immediately spawn shift over. Those benefits almost always outweigh the cost of enabling a few stray blueberries to have an easier time making bad decisions and not being on the active objective. Later on in the advanced guide, I'm going to talk about more situations like this, where you could do something that could technically be good for your team, but also allow for people to make poor decisions easier. It's not necessarily easy looking at not just the benefits of constructing fobs, but also the potential downsides, so I want to save that for later on, but you can look forward to that in the future. Up until this point, I've talked a lot about when you should be moving, but I have not yet discussed how you should be moving. One misconception that a lot of new SLs have is that squad matches have some sort of front line. The reality of the situation is that squad maps are kilometers and kilometers across, with only 80 people loaded in the map at any point. Unless you're playing on an incredibly small or linear map, there is rarely a front line in the sense that people imagine. Instead, you need to be thinking of it as hotspots. When moving from point A to point B, I take into consideration what I like to call the blueberry effect. 
The blueberry effect is just a stupid phrase I use to summarize the actions of the average to below average squad player in relation to the current active objectives and spawn points. I use it on a small scale, focusing on the average firefights that take place between two main spawn points, all the way to the squad scale, where I'm looking at the movements of squads across the battlefield. Let's take a look at Gorodok here and assume that Saloniki and Industrial Park are the two active objectives. Mentally draw a circle around each objective roughly as far out as you would imagine an external FOB might be. I would say usually 300 to 400 meters. This is going to be where the defenders of both points might potentially be. Now draw a straight line connecting the two objectives. This is where the board defenders and the lazy attackers will be found. The people who don't have the creativity to imagine flanking or the patience to wait around near cap range. Now, on a map as large as Gorodok, you don't have to worry about this middle bit quite as much since people are less likely to feel the incentive to walk between objectives, but on closer space objectives you will see it all of the time where very bored, uncreative players will spawn on the defensive fob and walk towards the attack objective. When relocating to or from an objective, you need to have this image painted in your head and avoid everywhere in red here. Not only should you not enter the red zones, but you shouldn't even be within audio of the red zones. You should also be aware of potential sight lines that somebody in these red zones might have on you if you're moving through open terrain. Prioritize forests over roads and fields when possible. Most often, you don't need to worry about running into enemy infantry or vehicles as long as you stay outside of this range. If you move between the flag and their main, it's possible that you'll encounter logistic routes or armor moving to and from their base. This example is obviously more significant since we're right outside of Russian main. Similarly, there's always a slim chance that you'll run into armor or another squad driving through the woods trying to relocate, but people drastically overestimate the likelihood of that. Take a look at the route that you're taking and ask yourself if the enemy has any reason to be there. If the answer is just maybe if they're in transit, then you're fine 99% of the time. The reality of the situation is that moving directly into where the enemy expects you is way more dangerous than loitering around, quote, behind enemy lines. This sounds kind of obvious, but I found a lot of times when I have a bunch of blueberries in my truck and I'm driving directly to the attack objective, they're quiet. But the moment I start going way behind and start getting kind of close to the enemy main and getting in round back, they start kind of freaking out. When in reality, they should be doing the exact opposite. Let's say you're moving from Neva Upper to Industrial Park. Here are a few examples of routes you shouldn't take and attack fobs that you should not be building. Now, on the flip side, here's an example of the route that I would be taking in a situation like this. Notice how it takes me well out of audio range of even the most scattered infantry at Industrial Park. From here, I would be able to coast quietly in with my truck to the very edge of audio range of the red zone here, set up my fob within the cover and concealment of a forest, and likely walk directly into cap range undetected from an angle that the enemy is not expecting. If that sounds unlikely to you, then you need to try a little experiment. Next time you're defending a flag, open your map and check how many people are looking in the exact opposite direction of the next flag in line. The answer is usually quite depressing. The tendency for squads to line up on the very edge of their defense objective facing the attack objective is hilariously noticeable in public games. Full 360 visual coverage of a defense objective is an incredibly easy thing to do in theory, but it's nobody's intuitive reaction after spawning. With minimal effort, you can easily make it into cap range before engaging targets. If you had to set up west of this objective, even if you weren't shot out of your truck before you made it within 400 meters, you would have been spotted immediately once you started pushing the objective. Your fob would be called out and you would be wiped in minutes. Now, I understand that this sounds like a really lengthy and unnecessary way for me to be saying flanking is good, which is pretty obvious, but it's much more than that. This is about understanding how predictably and reliably the enemy team behaves. A massive part of my squad leading doctrine is counting on and capitalizing on the relatively low skill level of the average squad player. Every time you see somebody on your team do something hilariously predictable and depressingly ineffective, start thinking about how you can take advantage of that when they are on the opposite team. 
don't forget that your team isn't any different from the enemy team. It's all just a collection of randomly assigned blueberries doing the exact same thing over and over again. Hence, the blueberry effect. Two more things I'd like to add to this blueberry effect topic before moving on. Once there has been contact at either flag, I would include that into your no drive zone. Assume that the defenders will push in the direction relentlessly until the contact is squashed and even then beyond some. Use that as an opportunity to take advantage of a neglected flank. Also, if a flag recently switched hands, add that old flag to the diagram here. People are still going to be there and people are still going to be relocating from there, often both friendlies and enemies. Now please note that there are also exceptions to all these things that I'm saying on certain maps. These rules that I've given were developed on and work best on large maps with spaced out objectives. They are also applicable to medium sized maps, but you have to be more careful. Take Fool's Road for example. The map is still reasonably large, but it's not massive. Even if the blueberry effect dictates that you're only likely to run into contacts between these two active objectives, don't forget that the difficulty of driving off-road on that map and the fairly limited road network create a pathway for more mobile squads. It's called Fool's Road for a reason, and that's because the road network that makes a ring around the entire map is an incredibly predictable path for flanks, logistics, or armor. Ambushes and coincidental run-ins are very common on this road. Now, I will still take my chances on the Fool's Road rather than walking into the brainless slaughter with the great blueberry migration between flags, but I'm not going to pretend that it's a perfect solution that won't get you into trouble from time to time. Everything is situational. Another counterpoint to the arguments I've made is Korra. Now, I hate Korra. Korra is the antithesis to everything I preach in my guides. It is the bane of my existence. This is a map with small, tight, closed-in borders making wide flanks in vehicles nearly impossible. Flanks need to be done on foot, which is time spent away from the objective. The narrow lanes available for movement completely counter everything I said about front lines not existing in squad. Korra is the one map where I would be hesitant to leave enemies behind me on an outdated objective, knowing that there is a damn good chance that they'll catch up to me on foot while I'm trying to wrestle a truck through the road network while avoiding the blueberry effect. On Korra, the blueberry effect itself can take over the entire map. Most of the objectives are near a map border, so if there are two active objectives, it really means that there are no sure safe routes to get from point A to point B in a vehicle. The map is small and tight enough that your engine noise will travel further than you might imagine with a quick glance at the map, and the road network will also take you in a winding path that will cover far more ground vertically, or I guess from north to south, than you'd like when you're moving east to west across the main stretch of the map. I'm likely going to be doing a series of map guides once I conclude these guides, and Korra will almost definitely be the first one since so much of what I teach here is completely negated by the design of that map. For now, just know that it takes a massive amount of map awareness, learning all of the sight lines, and figuring out the limited safe routes for vehicles to take. That, or you're going to be doing a lot of walking and spending a nearly unacceptable amount of time off of objectives in order to move between objectives. It is a very difficult map for my playstyle. Other examples of maps like this are Sumari or Koken. Sumari is small enough that walking between objectives doesn't take long enough to put your team at a serious disadvantage, so vehicle play is often negated. You can still technically sneak some trucks around the map border if the fighting is entirely focused on the opposite end of the map, but that's fairly uncommon. And then Kokan is open enough that as long as the two active objectives aren't stretching the fight across the most of the map, you still have at least one flank option going around the border of the map. So you can still make quick flanks and really practice what I'm preaching here with mobility section if you have some solid map understanding and know how to duck around the berms for concealment. That being said, oftentimes the two objectives are on opposite map borders, making these flanks risky, and it does require quite a bit of map knowledge to get consistent with getting from point A to point B without being slaughtered. Another quick example, without getting into too much detail, of a map that might not necessarily follow the rules I've listed here is Talil Outskirts. I would say that the same core concepts apply, the difference being that you need to be really extreme with your flanks, as the range you can be detected is much greater. Also, due to the lack of concealment, vehicles are a much bigger threat. 
on Gorodok or Yiho, as long as you stick to the woods or back roads, you're not very likely to run into or be spotted by any tanks or anything outside of earshot. But on Talil, even if you take the widest possible route, you're still taking a risk and you might get blown up by a tank a kilometer out. And of course, last but not least, Logar Valley, or TDM Valley as we like to call it. With the objectives as tightly packed as they are in the center of the map, flanks are simply going to need to be done on foot. And even then, they're really not going to be as effective in dense urban combat. You're not sneaking any lodges around that map, especially if the enemy team decides that they would rather you didn't. It's incredibly easy to make the entire map center a no lodgy zone with two well-placed HMGs or SPGs. Now the last thing I'd like to mention about this is that you personally should be the one who's driving. Now, a lot of people would argue against this, and they would have some fairly decent points. For example, the SL has a lot of other tasks that he needs to be worried about, a lot of communicating to do, a lot of looking at the map, and so consequently somebody else should be driving under his directions. And that is a fair point, but there's a couple of things that it's not taking into consideration. First of all, general experience. If you remember way back in the beginning of this guide, I gave that example of a truck running off the road and flipping, and consequently your team being down nine men from the game start. If you're assigning the driving to a random person, you are throwing the dice with that kind of an experience. You yourself, if you continue to drive at every single match start, game after game after game, will start to develop a really good system for it. You'll start to learn the glitchy squad physics, you'll start to get really quick around those corners, and you'll start to decrease the amount of time it takes to get to those midpoints, all of which are super important. It may not be very milsimmy or very realistic, but in this game, how fast you can drive can actually win or lose games. Second of all, you're the one making the decisions, and sometimes you need to make those decisions incredibly quickly. It's not uncommon for me to be in a truck driving towards two active objectives and still not being entirely sure which one I want to go to. I want to be driving down the map in such a way that will allow me to get to either objective equally quickly, and I want to be able to make that choice immediately and react immediately. It's kind of frustrating to have somebody else driving, and I have to give them instructions, because you can only give instructions so far ahead. I could theoretically say I would like to be either at this point or this point, and then tell him to drive somewhere towards the middle and get ready to react to either, and that would possibly be the best action, but it is relying a bit on their experience, and the more likely thing that you'll be able to do is simply placing markers on the map every so often, every intersection, and trying to kind of guide him in. You guys might not necessarily agree with me here, but I do find that quite frustrating, and I would much rather be able to slam on the A key or slam on the D key, depending on which objective I decide, and make a split-second decision. On the topic of split-second decisions, you might run into contact, and if you do, the last thing you want is your entire squad dismounting and going into that contact and getting fucked up. Generally speaking, if you're driving a Lodgy and you make contact with something out in the middle of nowhere, you want to be yelling for everyone to stay in the truck, or yelling AT's dismount if it's an enemy vehicle, and then keeping going as fast as you possibly can and trying to get out of that area. You do not want to be stuck in the middle of nowhere. The worst situation would be for everyone in your squad to dismount, your truck to get destroyed, and nobody to get killed. It would be much better to either get out of there alive or get blown up entirely with everyone inside the truck and then be able to make a new decision and get a new vehicle and get to a relevant objective faster. Now I'm getting to the point here where we're about to wrap up this guide, and I'd like to say a few more things before we go. First off, yes, I've only included how you should be driving across the map and not what you should be doing once you get to the objectives. Once again, most of the in-depth analysis of attacking and defending objectives will be in the advanced guide, which will be coming later on. Second off, I have only been mentioning trucks here. Everything I've said has been under the assumption that you are driving an unarmored truck. And the reason for this is because, honestly, as an SL, I would recommend that you almost always stick with transport or logistic trucks. The next part in this guide is going to focus almost entirely on vehicles and why I think this is the case. You may disagree with me, but hopefully I'll be able to persuade you and change your mind in the next one. 
One last thing, I did initially say that this video was going to be in three parts, but as is becoming very common, it's dragging on longer than expected, so I think I might set it up for four separate parts. If I do, the next video will focus entirely on vehicles, and then the video afterwards will focus on habs and spawn points. Anyway, stick around for that, consider subscribing if you haven't already, and I will catch you guys in the next one.